escape with us on a magical midsummer journey as we meander through central Sweden. This charming train will give us a rare glimpse into the country's rich cultural heart. It's always magic here. Before taking us far into the Arctic wilderness where reindeer roam and the high summer sun never dips below the horizon. I see the, all the flowers, all the trees, all the mountains and snow. It's a surrogate, it's a land for a reindeer, a land for me too. We'll hear tales of lake monsters. Go to the propeller, we could not survive, I think. Yeah. And meet the people who live and work along this little known route. I love my landscape. Yes, I do. I really do. This is no ordinary railway journey. This is one of the most scenic railway journeys in the world, Sweden. We're in Midwest Sweden, about to embark on a leisurely and characterful two-day adventure. It's just after lunchtime at Mora Station, where we're hopping aboard a 1970s Italian-made rail car, which is only in service for 10 weeks a year over summer. We'll have three onboard guides along our 663 mile route. The first is Elizabeth, who will be with us throughout day one. Welcome on board this train that's bound for Östersund tonight. And tomorrow we are going up to Gällivare. I try to guide you. The guides oversee everything, from feeding passengers information about the journey to pointing them towards the facilities. In the, this train, we have a toilet in the middle of the train that you can use. You have to be strong because the door is, mm, you have to push up the door, otherwise you can't get it up. The door might be a bit stiff, but everything else on this train is pretty relaxed. While there's a timetable, there's wiggle room for the driver to stop along the way to allow passengers like Lars to take in the sights. I think the train is very relaxing. It, it's uh, very comfortable. You just sit there and look at the nature and um, yeah, just enjoy the trip. It's perfect in my opinion. Our first leg starts in Mora in Dalarna County, the home of Swedish folk tradition. We'll then head north to Storsjön, where a lake monster is said to lurk, before arriving in Östersund, where we'll stop for the night. On day two, we'll travel into Swedish Lapland, where we'll disembark to visit a famous smokery, before we cross the Arctic Circle to meet a forager at Jokmok, Finally, we'll reach Yalavare, where our train terminates and where we'll helicopter into the Sarik National Park. We're traveling through the Dalarna province, known as Sweden in miniature, because it encapsulates so much of the country's culture, including its iconic red buildings. That's typical Dalarna or Sweden scenery with these red houses and I haven't seen this type of painting of houses anywhere else. It's a tradition that dates back over 300 years thanks to a vast nearby copper mountain which produces the iron ochre that gives the paint its color. Back in the 17th century this mine was providing 70% of Europe's copper bankrolling Sweden. 
but after it collapsed in 1687, it became the source of today's famous Fallon red paint. Now I'm talking in Swedish. Hey, hey, Swedish. This is the home of another Swedish red icon, a decorative wooden horse called the Dala horse. Local craftsmen have been carving them for over 200 years, and we're getting off the train to see one of them in action. Stefan. When people think of Sweden, they think of Dala horses, and it's nice to be a part of that and to be able to pass it on. I'm proud of that. The carving and painting of these toy horses is a skill that's been passed down since the 17th century, when it started out as a hobby, keeping workers busy through Sweden's long nights. The men worked in the forests during the winter months, and uh, the days were short and dark quite early, so they spent a lot of time in the cabins, and many times they carved a horse. Eventually, the toy horses gained economic value. As people began using them to barter, their production became a valuable sideline for many a peasant family, and the designs grew more and more intricate. We have a basic pattern to follow, but yet we do have quite some freedom to give our own touch to each horse, and they become very lively and colorful. We used to say that uh, when we're completed with the horse is when the tail is done. <laughs> That's the last touch. Finished, done. Back on our little Italian-made train, we're enjoying some of the best vistas Delana has to offer, something Elizabeth never tires of. We have a summer season and a winter season, and people ask me, do you think it's boring? And it's never boring. Never, ever, because every day is different, and you see how the nature changes. You see all the animals. Uh, I love this. In the winter, everything is white. White, white, white. And in the summer, everything is green, green, green. <laughs> so it's, it's the same, but very different. The Swedish people love their nature, celebrating it year round. We're lucky enough to be here during a high point in the calendar, midsummer and no place does it bigger than Delana. Ladies and gentlemen, Ursa. And we're alighting here to join the festivities with host Michaela. We come together and eat and sing and dance around the maypole. Early in the morning we come together and we do this flower crowns. So it's a very traditional and good feeling thing we do. And we start midsummer with that. The festival is all about giving thanks to Mother Nature. The flowers, a symbol of rebirth and fertility, are gathered by the women who wear traditional costume, each one unique to her own parish. The girls used to pick seven different flowers and then they put them under the pillows and they sleep on it and then they say they're going to dream about the future husbands. So I think it's magic. And no party is complete without dancing around the maypole and singing about, well, frogs, obviously. We have this uh, dance calling Smogrodorna. It's a uh, song about small frogs and no ears and no tails and we go around the pole dancing together 
and we sing. Små grodorna, små grodorna. Da 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 da. Yeah, we have fun. So fun. So it's always magic here. We're leaving the midsummer madness behind to continue through the center of Sweden toward the wild waters of Delana. It's day one of a slow scenic jaunt aboard a retro train which takes us through the heart of Sweden, stopping along the way so passengers can linger at leisure. Well, I like Sweden and the landscape very much because it's not so crowded. You have a lot of nature, you can be by yourself in the nature, in the forest. Coming out like this is very, very relaxing for body and soul, I would say. <laughs> With the first leg of this 663-mile journey behind us, our train will continue through Delana. We'll visit a traditional farmhouse for refueling before moving on to a great lake with a mythical monster, after which we'll make an overnight stop in the county capital, Östersund. We're still deep in Delana, traveling towards a vast sandstone canyon. And there's only one way to get across the top of it. Built in 1902, this bridge might look rickety, but it certainly stood the test of time. 111 feet high, it traverses the Ermen River, and midway across, our train slows to offer passengers views of the stunning Storstipet waterfall down below. The view you have from the bridge, it's amazing. This is very high. Very beautiful. Really amazing what nature can do. You become very impressed by the things that nature can create and also a little bit humble. Lars is certainly impressed, but lingering at that height wasn't for everyone. It's like my feet are hurting a bit because it's so high up. And then they were like, let's stop here. And I'm like, no, just go. <laughs> It's mid-afternoon and passengers are getting peckish. So our train will soon be making a very special stop to pick up some refreshment. Now we are coming through a Fågelsjö. You want to translate it, it's Bird Lake. And it's a little, little village in the wood here. We'll be collecting some fika, which loosely translates as coffee and cake but it's much more than just a word to the Swedish people. Fika is stronger than a tradition. It's, a, it's an institution where we drink coffee and maybe have some cake or sandwich in the afternoon. And it's very similar to the afternoon tea that you have in UK. If Swedes don't get the coffee during the day, they will become very, very troublesome and even angry. <laughs> Difficult as it is to imagine Lars angry, with a pit stop mere moments away, it's something we'll hopefully never have to witness. Food. Mm. Look, there she stands with coffee and sandwiches. Hopefully. <laughs> Look forward to have something to eat.
Today's food has been specially prepared two miles from our stop in a cafe attached to a folk museum. The train in Landsbanan goes by Fogelsjö station twice a day and usually it stops for about a 20 minute stop and we go there and we serve Swedish fika. We have a person in the cafe baking these delicious cinnamon buns that are very traditional. Giesen is manager of seven original farmhouses built by 17th century Finnish settlers now open to visitors. One of them was closed up over a hundred years ago and frozen in time. The farmhouse is from 1818. The last couple that lived in this farm up until 1910 decided to build a brand new house and modernize with electricity and running water and uh, moved across the yard on Christmas Eve in 1910 and decided to just lock the doors to the old farmhouse and keep it and preserve it for future generations. With its interior totally intact, all the family's possessions still lie in situ, exactly as they would have over two centuries ago. And as well as being able to immerse themselves in 17th century living, visitors can enjoy the fika that's freshly prepared here every day. Yes. Mm. It's good? It's delicious. All we need is a cup of coffee. Back on board, passengers are revived and tempers remain unfrayed. <laughs> We're now heading into Jämtland, a sprawling, sparsely populated province in the Midwest, home to some of the country's tallest peaks and numerous mountain lakes. I want you to look at this because this is so, this is the most amazing about Jämtland. You see the lake, you see the mountains, you see the light, especially in this time of year. I love my landscape. Yes, I do. I really do. Our train is passing the fifth largest lake in the country, which is also huge in Swedish folklore, thanks to a resident monster said to lurk in its murky 250-foot depths. Sweden's own Loch Ness monster was first spotted in 1635 by a local church minister who described it as a strange animal with a black serpent-like body and cat-like head. We've gone off the rails to get onto a boat with Kurt and Evert, who's come up close and personal with the monster twice to see if it will rear its head today. Beautiful day. Just perfect. Hopefully we can see anything. How many years was it when you had this experience with the Great Lake Monster? How many years? First time 1994 and second time 2005. I was busy. And um, something got on the line known, sir. And the boat started to go backwards. Right. And in the next moment comes something like a long cow. Um, longer than the boat. Right. It was dangerous because uh, the body of this animal was about two meters from the propeller. Right. And if go to the propeller, we would not survive, I think. Right. I, I, I'm also very afraid. It's amazing. Did you see how long it was? At least 15 meters long. 15? 15 meters long. 
While it's possible Kurt's fallen for a local fisherman's joke, hook, line and sinker, there have been around 500 similar sightings over the last 400 years. How does it feel to be back? Oh, it's, it's good. <laughs> and here is a place for a monster. But like many great legends, this monster is keeping a low profile today. And it remains a fascinating myth. Back on the train, passengers are enjoying watching the landscape change as we enter an area thick with birch forests. This trip is as much a celebration of nature as a way of getting from A to B. The Swedes' love of nature extends beyond just being outdoors in all seasons. Nature also means nourishment. And their passion for foraging has put them on the global gourmet map. We've stepped off the train to meet Peter, who makes wine from birch sap, Sweden's national tree. You need a lot of sap when you're making wine. So every spring I collect about 100,000 liters in 20, 21 days. That's my window. When you're harvesting sap, you uh, drill a little, little hole in the, in the tree, and then you put the, the tube into the tree, and the bird sap is dropping down to the can, plastic can. And it fills this can in about two days. Over 20 years ago, Peter chanced upon a birch sap wine recipe in a botanical book from 1785. He spent years adapting it to perfect the taste of his Swedish salve. Today, his distillery produces 200,000 bottles a year, exporting around the world. The wine is special because it's very dry. It's not so much sugar in it. And also, it tastes like you're walking in a, a birch forest. That's amazing. And also the, the alcohol, you, you don't even feel the alcohol. It's a truly unique sparkling wine made from nature using great innovation. Back on our Inlands Bannon train, it's just gone 6 p.m. Ladies and gentlemen, when we're coming to the station in Östersund. And we're pulling into Östersund, the largest city in the province, where we'll be stopping for the night. So thank you very much and have a nice evening. Goodbye. Tomorrow, we continue north where we'll sample some locally smoked food before we cross over into the Arctic Circle and fly over the breathtaking Sarik National Park. It's day two of a midsummer adventure aboard our little 1970s rail car from mid-Sweden into the Arctic. Just after 7 a.m., we're about to depart Östersund Station alongside two new passengers and our second host on this trip, William. Sure. 
Well, good morning everyone and very welcome on board to Inlandsbanan and our train that is bound for Jällevare. My name is William, I will be your train attendant working on board today. Alongside me in the forward part of the train, we have our lovely train driver, Pelle. William will be guiding us along the next eight hour stretch of this whimsical jaunt. And uh, if you are one of those persons who like to be standing, I recommend you to be seated. An accident can happen far too easy and you will be the one cleaning it up. This rail journey is not only one of the world's most scenic, it's one of the most relaxed. Its schedule allows for spontaneous stops along the way. We have a timetable, but we don't need to rush from one point A to point B. For us, the journey is the whole point. So if it takes five minutes longer for us to reach the destination, so be it. Two hundred miles into our journey, we're heading towards the Arctic Circle. Our train will continue north, where we'll sample some locally smoked food. We'll then cross into the Sami territory of Yokmok, before reaching our destination, Yalavare. We've just entered Swedish Lapland. And Maria and her husband are taking advantage of the long days to see some of the area by bike. It's, it's uh, exciting, it's, it's a little bit different. And um, uh, I want to see the north and uh, the midnight sun for real. Four hours into our journey, we're now traveling through Laponia. And as it's just past midday, it's time to sample some traditional North Swedish fare. This is where we eat our lunch, uh, because we don't have a dining car with us. This is a privately owned little fish smokery. He has won a lot of uh, medals in the Swedish uh, food championships. We're at Bergman's Fisk and Vilt, the foundations of which began in 1902, when Martin's grandfather began smoking his own fish. The special thing is that we make it in an uh, old traditional way, how people have been making food in many hundred years. As the fifth generation of smokers, Martin grew up learning the trade from his uncles. After years of working as a hunting and fishing guide, he decided to build his own smokehouse. Here we have salmon that we're going to smoke tonight. So now this one is in just lying in salt for a couple of hours. And after that we put it on these wagons and have a special marinade on. This smoke we start very early this morning. And this one is uh, one of our most popular product. This is a pepper smoked salmon. And uh, this one we have with the Swedish championship with. So this smoke we make every day. So we have fresh new smoked salmon in our shop and also in the restaurant. What makes this smoked fish so special is the firewood that Martin uses. It's from his own private fir forest. So now we put on this one to make a very good uh, smell and taste. And this is the, the wood that we use. When you tap them and you make the high clink, ding, 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 you know that they are dry. If they are too much water, they boom, boom, boom. That's how we control if the wood is dry. Back 
Back on board, we've picked up a new gaggle of guests. They're here with retired journalist turned tour guide, Christina, who led a hard fought battle to save this railway. 1991 was the big fight, the real big fight when we asked people, sign for Inland Spanen if you want to have it still. Twenty years ago, government cutbacks threatened the line. But Christina used her newspaper to gather nearly half a million signatures and together with local communities along the route, persuaded the powers that be to keep it open. It was a journalistic school. For me and for us it was because we give people opportunity to stay here, to earn their money, to live here. It's something very special. Since we left Östersund, we've covered over 230 miles. We're continuing north through Lapland, Sweden's largest province, but home to just 1.3% of the country's population. We are uh, soon coming to Sosjele, which you could say is the halfway point for today's journey. When we arrive, we'll be saying goodbye to William. I'm switching trains, so I'm taking the southbound train today. Karen is taking over and will be our third and final host on the last five hours of this trip. We have two teams, you can call it, one southern team and one northern team, and I'm part of the northern team that goes from Storulman to Gällivare. Although this part of the country is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, it's so remote, it's unknown to many of its own people. Even for people in Sweden, it's very exotic. Some of these people haven't seen reindeers before. And they haven't met uh, Lapish people. It's important and it's beautiful. It's just before 7 p.m. and our train is about to reach the most photographed place on the Inland Bannon route. We are at the Arctic Circle. Yep. Two days and 397 miles into our journey, we finally reached the invisible line that marks the Arctic Circle, where for days, each year, the sun never dips below the horizon. We're now just 60 miles from our destination, where we'll take to the skies to visit Sarak National Park, an ancient Sami stomping ground to go in search of its majestic reindeer. We're 600 miles into one of the world's most scenic railway journeys. Traveling through remote Swedish Lapland towards our journey's end, Yalavar. It's nearly 8 p.m. 
as we're about to pull into the Arctic town of Yokmok, our penultimate stop. Meaning river bend in the indigenous language, this is known as the Sami capital of Lapland. And we're getting off here to meet Eva, who spent years studying and teaching a major part of Sami culture. I am a forager and for the last 10 years I have been teaching what edible plants we have and uh, both for eating, because that's my passion, <laughs> but also about spices and uses because we find so many great things in the surroundings that we just take for granted. Originally from Stockholm, Eva became an expert in what she calls her wild pantry when she met her Sami husband. It's knowing which plants grow a lot, which ones uh, you have to be careful about, which ones are poisonous, there are some. These are the flowers of Labrador tea. And this is a wild rhododendron that grows everywhere here in the forest. And it, it's a little bit poisonous, so you have to be careful. But I use it as a spice. And it's also good to have a tea against cough or fever and things like that. So very, very aromatic and lovely plant. And then we have all the berries. Small green berries that will become blue in July. A really aromatic, it's a bilberry. In her kitchen, Eva uses her rich pickings to create delicacies such as birch crackers, bark breads, and traditional hot drinks. I'm making my take on Swedish glug. And uh, glug is a little bit like glühwein or spiced sweetened wine. So instead of wine, I use berries like uh, lingonberries and like blueberries and bilberries and crowberries. So I made a juice out of those berries and I sweeten it a little bit. And then I used the strongest spice I know, which in this area is the Labrador tea. And uh, for me, this is sort of the flavor of the forest. Yeah. Okay. Back on board, we've left Yokmok behind, and Karen, our host, is making the most of the endless summer light to enjoy the final 50-mile stretch. A bit of a luxury to be able to sit down and enjoy the view into Yelivara. It's just after 9 p.m. in the land of the midnight sun. And two days after we got on at Mora, we finally made it to Yalavare, an ancient iron mining town. It's the gateway to Sweden's extraordinary Arctic region. But our journey's not over. The best is yet to come. We're about to visit an ancient Sami stomping ground in a most modern way. We're joining Per Olaf, a reindeer herder, to visit the spectacular Sarik National Park, a true gem of the Arctic. You know, that's the last wilderness in Europe, and I live there. That's my home. Mm -hmm. 
With nearly a hundred glaciers and its famous Rapa Valley River Delta, this vast stretch of land is the most mountainous in Sweden. It's been home to the indigenous people for millennia, and in 1910, it was made a protected national park. It's also home to Pear's herd of reindeer, who can roam for hundreds of miles, so the easiest way to locate them is from the sky. I need eat this. It's really good. Really good. Many, many vitamins from the sun. <laughs> Pear Olaf has managed finally to track them down. This is my reindeer, my family's reindeer. Anna, what? No. These elusive animals are the stuff of European legend, and for thousands of years, they provided the Sami with much more than food, but clothing, transport, and companionship. It's a relationship founded upon deep respect. It's really nice when they know me. They smell me. They know my voice. I have grown up with the reindeer. I'm born here. This is my life. I don't need money here. I have food here and fish in the lake and meat with the reindeer. It's so peaceful. Sarek is a land for a reindeer, a land for me too. On our 663-mile adventure up through Sweden, we've experienced its classic culture in the country's folk heartlands. We've enjoyed traditional foraged fare and come up close and personal with Lapland's famed creatures. All aboard an eccentric slow train where deadlines are unimportant, and what matters most is the journey itself. And Bill's back next week at eight, chowing down on some chroma crab and exploring the beautiful Norfolk Broad. Susan Kalman's new series of Grand Days Out starts tomorrow at nine. Next tonight on Channel 5, it's Tristan's birthday, but birthdays don't always go to plan. Settle down round the telly for new, all creatures great and small, in just a moment.